Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 21st of November, and this is Govind Raj Athiraj, based in Mumbai, India's financial capital, but presently in transit. Our top stories and themes for the day: India's GDP growth will slow with general elections next year before accelerating again, says Goldman Sachs. Small loans rise as does indebtedness. Who will bell this cat? Sam Altman joins Microsoft. Will that make AI better or safer? Air traffic hits a fresh record high over the weekend. And Australia took the World Cup for the sixth time. Lessons for India. This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. Markets and outlook. India's real GDP growth will decline marginally to 6.3% in 2024 from the 6.4% estimated for 2023. Investment bank Goldman Sachs said on Monday, also pointing to political uncertainty being the main domestic risk in the context of the ongoing state and next year's general elections. The next calendar year will be of two halves, wherein the government spending before the upcoming general elections will be the key driver for growth, while after the elections, it will be the re-acceleration in investment growth, especially from the private sector, Goldman Sachs said in a report quoted by Business Standard. From a fiscal year perspective, the brokerage said it expects growth to accelerate to about 6.5% for 24-25 from the 6.2% it has projected for the ongoing 23-24. It says that India has the best structural growth prospects in the region and it believes that GDP growth is likely to stay robust at about 6.3% year-on-year in 2024. Also adding that India is less sensitive to potential external shocks like longer rates globally and persistent dollar strength and geopolitical uncertainties. Actually, most brokerages and rating firms are holding their projections around these levels, which may be good at one level, which suggests stability, but at another level, not so good considering that we are a country with fairly strong growth aspirations. I do find it interesting that Goldman, among other banks and analysts like Jefferies, have already laid out their worst-case scenarios on what could happen if the elections don't go in favor of the ruling BJP. Jeffrey's global strategist Chris Wood said a few weeks ago, for example, that the markets would fall 25% if the BJP did not make it back. Others may not have used the same words but hinted at the same thing. I guess it's the job of analysts and strategists to factor in the unexpected, but their narrative seems to run a little differently from, let's say, the political analysts who, at least in public, seem to feel confident of a BJP return. Goldman points out, as we know, that election season is already underway with assembly polls in five states to be followed by the general elections later, and saying that these outcomes will be keenly watched by investors from the standpoint of economic reforms and or policy continuity. Goldman Sachs said that they expect the government to intervene through subsidies or other measures to keep a lid on food prices in an election year. And that process, as you know, and as we've been talking about on the core report, has already begun in earnest with, for example, non-Basmati rice exports being banned, wheat banned much earlier, sugar exports being banned, and other prices being managed. All of which, of course, is to the positive end to the customer. The somewhat elevated inflation relative to the target will limit the room for monetary easing, and the Reserve Bank can cut rates only by about 0.5% to 6% by early 25, Goldman predicted. Meanwhile, in the markets yesterday, the indices started the week on a somewhat muted to weak note as with the Sensex closing about 140 points lower at 65,655, the Nifty 50 on the other hand ended down 38 points at 19,694. Finance stocks, including the likes of Bajaj Finance, which saw two of its lending products being suspended by the Reserve Bank last week, fell further and more on that subject shortly. In international markets, the dollar has been seen as generally weaker in the last few days, though that did not or has not been helping the rupee all that much, except to keep it steady. Oil has risen in anticipation of extensions or deepening of production cuts at a Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries meeting coming up next weekend. Oil is now inched up to around $82 a barrel. Back in the markets, it's also a major initial public offer or IPO week with some 7,000 crores worth of offerings lined up from companies like Flair Writing Industries, Tata Technologies, Gandhar Oil Refinery, Fed Bank Financial Services and Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency. The interesting thing about many of these IPOs, as has been often the case in this current rush, is that these are older companies, though many cases it's the promoters who are liquidating some of their holdings. 
But I'm guessing a 30-year wait or so is fine if the company is doing well and investors are, of course, okay with the price. The first that I picked is Flair Writing, an almost 50-year-old company going public. It has its own brands of pens, which you may have seen, and also franchises, brands like Pierre Cardin and Hauser of Germany. They started Technologies, about 34 years old, an engineering consulting and R&D company. It's large. It has almost 12,000 employees working for it in areas ranging from aerospace to automotive and industrial heavy machinery. Gandhar Oil is a white oil or highly refined mineral oil manufacturing company set up around 30 years ago in Mumbai. White oil is used by the drugs and cosmetics industries, among others. For all these IPOs and all the numbers that you may need, you should obviously look them up yourself and go through the details before you invest if you so decide to. Who will tackle the small loan problem? The Reserve Bank of India, as we've been discussing here, has tightened norms for personal loans in India, making it more expensive for banks and their intermediaries to lend. The increase in risk weightages is also a warning shot of sorts, telling the system that it needs to be on alert. The problem with small loans and individual personal loans is that it has exploded thanks to one, the need for debt to fuel and fund mostly or what appears like lifestyle expenditure as some call it, and second, the ease with which people can access loans, including by perhaps, and in many cases, the tapping of an icon on a smartphone. The challenge is thus both on the demand and supply side. On the supply side, possibly the Reserve Bank has done what it can. Also remember that spending and consumerism, and not necessarily in a bad way, is what the economy needs. The problem is when people in their mid-twenties earning around 5 lakhs a year start running up debt. So what can be done on the demand side? How can borrowing be constrained somewhat? Could there be disincentives? And finally, what about the role of fintech companies? Could there be some relook as to ensure that there is more responsibility in their actions or bring in more friction into the process, which of course goes against their very grain and existence? So what's the solution or what are the possible solutions? So the core report will try and bring in different voices in this subject in coming days. I began with reaching out to Vivek Ayer, partner and national leader for financial services risk at audit firm Grant Thornton. And I began by asking him how he was viewing the landscape of small loan debt at this point. Yes, the personal loans have been increasing, you know, from a portfolio standpoint and the percentage of unsecured lending as a part of the overall credit portfolio has been increasing. So from a balance sheet and a systemic risk standpoint, RBI concerns are not misplaced. They are right in the sense that it is a substantially rise and there needs to be a focus from a portfolio quality standpoint. Whether risk weight, increasing the risk weight is an answer or not, right now in terms of the way I see it is that risk weight may not be the most appropriate answer. The reason is because what is essentially happening is you're increasing the cost of credit at a point in time when a lot of demand from an economic standpoint is driven only domestically, not you know, the, the, the global macroeconomic conditions are difficult. So you're kind of hurting the growth story from an India standpoint, from a risk weight standpoint. Having said that, the underlying problem that exists is definitely something that needs to be corrected. And I feel that a supervisory oversight on that portfolio combined with, you know, tighter and stronger credit underwriting standards as well as portfolio monitoring is something that the industry should do. Risk weights basically at a point in time when the cost of capital is increasing globally and the interest rates are expected to remain higher, will only exacerbate the problem in terms of killing the demand. So, not very sure in terms of that's the answer. It would be useful if the regulator, in terms of, comes up with a timeline to say that this risk weight will be, you know, the percentage that they are suggested for about 18 months, both which we will revert. Okay, so you're saying in a way, at some point, it should be rolled back. And that's fine from, I think, the macro and the bank balance sheet point of view. But if I were to look at it from the demand side, I think the problem, as many would agree, is a it's a lifestyle consumption-driven feature or phenomenon. And a lot of young people, most of them earning under 5 lakhs per annum, are taking loans or under the buy now, pay later kind of thing. I mean, how does one address that side of the problem? So yes, of course, in terms of fueling consumption and not focusing on investment is definitely a problem. In terms of the whole idea of unsecured lending is the ecosystem start needs to align a good balance between investment-related lending and lending from a consumption standpoint. Not to say that consumption-driven lending shouldn't be there. But if you literally were to break down the portfolio, there is unwanted focus on consumption. A very simple example 
would be go to any chroma. You go to any chroma, buy an electronic good. Even if you want to make an entire payment, the salesman will insist on you for taking an EMI option. In fact, and it's an experience I've personally had in terms of where is a push to opt for a credit product. And I believe that that is a big problem. Definitely, there should be a consumption-focused loan for a person who, you know, who genuinely wants to move up the mobility ladder, you know, social mobility upwards. These are great ways of facilitating that because incomes will increase, a person will grow. But to use this purely to promote consumption-driven credit only is a big challenge. And that's something that they potentially, in terms of the ecosystem, needs to change. Not to say that consumption-driven credit shouldn't be there. But, you know, credit card is not an option for everyone, you know. But definitely, there are liquidity challenges between two salaries. There is a liquidity challenge people will have. And this helps there. But to basically drive credit crazily just from a consumption perspective may not necessarily be the answer. Right. And yeah, and that's an important point. I think that you're saying that basically when there is the uh, facility available or you're nudged towards that facility of, let's say, taking an EMI and so on. And coincidentally, the Reserve Bank, one of the products it banned from Bajaj Finance was the Insta EMI, banned or suspended. So the next question, therefore, is, I mean, so the the traction of these products is clearly one part of the problem because the frictionlessness of it which is what causes people to tap on something and you get a loan or you get 10,000 rupees in your bank account or you're able to buy something immediately at electronic store. So how does one address that side? See, in terms of addressing it from that side, what would be useful is in terms of, definitely the answer shouldn't be in terms of saying that the electronic stores or the front-end customer stores, they basically need to start evaluating from a credit acting standpoint. What significantly is important is for each one of the financial institutions to actually look at the portfolio and see what's the kind of exposure that they're taking. What's the kind of stress tests they're running. Nobody from a stress test standpoint. See, the problem is that most of the stress test framework uses variables that you know they've experienced in the past. There are uh, global uncertainties. What's going to be the impact as a result of that? If the war persists or the West Asia conflict kind of escalates and there is a longer period of uncertainties that continue, what's going to be the impact on the portfolio in India? And are those test test frameworks really incorporating all those scenarios? And are people looking at their portfolios? I think that's the bigger concern. Now, because stress testing frameworks, their effectiveness involves scenarios that have no one has experienced before. That's why the RBI kind of came and said, let me increase the risk rates. Because the idea of a stress testing framework is to keep aside more capital. And if people don't have a sense of what those scenarios are, let me proactively go and increase the risk rate for some time. But in my view, it should be more in terms of a risk weight or a, it should have more been a buffer provision instead of an increased risk weight. I mean, that's really the piece. The intent of the regulator, you know, well-intentioned, execution could have been a little better. That's that's the problem. Okay, so that's one part of the problem. So, so you're saying that we don't need to really worry about, let's say, fintechs, greasing, oiling, accelerating the flow to people at levels clearly which we've never ever seen? Yes, in terms of we don't need to the real control. See, the fintechs basically in terms of will get more customers into the ecosystem. Because at the end of the day, each one of the fintechs are focused on adding more customers into the ecosystem. It is the balance sheets that are leveraged where they actually need to take a more balanced task. So probably they need to start cutting the exposures. Because the fintechs are going over the moment the amount of the limits that are available to fintechs are reduced, automatically the ecosystem will be controlled. And expecting the fintechs to do less, that necessarily may not be the answer. But if the amount of balance sheet that is actually made available to them to lend is reduced, then that could be a potential answer. Right, Vivek. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Sam Altman comes to Microsoft. Is that a good thing? The great Bay Area drama continues with new twists and turns in the plot every hour seemingly. But for now, it seems to have settled somewhat, with OpenAI naming ex-Twitch boss the gaming company Emmett Shear as interim CEO, while outgoing chief Sam Altman is set to join backer Microsoft. That's the backer of OpenAI. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella said in posts on X that Altman would become CEO of a new research group inside the software maker, along with other departing OpenAI colleagues, such as outgoing President Greg Brockman, who quit following Altman's ouster. 
In a statement on the social media platform X, Shear dismissed speculation that OpenAI's board ousted Altman because of a spat over the safety of powerful AI models, though he did vow to open an investigation into the firing and consider new governance for OpenAI and continue its path of making technology like its viral chatbot available, Reuters reported. I'm not crazy enough to take this job without both support for commercializing our awesome models, Shear said, adding, OpenAI's stability and success are too important to allow turmoil to disrupt them like this. The appointment settled late into the night on Sunday following Altman's abrupt departure just days before as CEO of the chat GPT maker and ended speculation that he could return, said Reuters. Though in a fresh twist on Monday morning US time, more than 500 employees of OpenAI threatened to leave the company if the current board doesn't resign and reinstate former chief executive Sam Altman and former president Greg Brockman. Now, OpenAI has about 770 workers, so 500 is a lot of them. Included in that list of names of signers was Ilya Sutskever, the company's chief scientist and one of the members of that four-person board that actually voted to oust Altman. So now, all these developments are very interesting. For one, this clearly means that Sam Altman, if he's ensconced or remains ensconced in Microsoft, is joining a larger company in a somewhat diminished role compared to the sheer press, power and adulation he enjoyed earlier. It's also a testament to Satya Nadella's skills and attraction as a leader that he could win Sam Altman over, whatever the background dealering would or could have been. And it must have been formidable to sign and seal a deliver perhaps in somewhere between 24 to 48 hours. More importantly, the question as I see it is that while OpenAI represented almost the wild west of AI with complete hell let loose on the world, could the Microsoft version of it, rather the advanced versions of it, since Microsoft and OpenAI already work together, and Microsoft has already rolled out AI-enhanced products like Copilot, could they be more benign and manageable? Well, the answer to that is something we obviously don't know as yet. But I would bet that Sam Altman and team in the Microsoft ecosystem could do good, if, of course, they're able to last. Air traffic hits a new high in India on the weekend. India's domestic air traffic touched a new high on Sunday with airlines carrying about 456,000 passengers with about 5,900 or close to 6,000 flight movements. On Saturday too, the air traffic number hit a new high of about 456,000 according to official data making it two historic days. It was also the highest post-COVID air traffic for two consecutive days. India is one of the fastest growing civil aviation markets in the world and domestic air traffic has already posted an annual growth of nearly 11% to about 12 million in October. Meanwhile, even Mumbai Airport said that it recorded about 18% more traffic and its international traffic grew about 20% in October. Speaking of air traffic, the Dubai Air Show, which was going on, wrapped up with ambitious plans announced and set. Dubai International Airport has now announced plans to boost capacity to 120 million passengers a year by 2026. That's not too far from about 100 million today. Saudi Arabia is ramping up steadily, also trying to be a Middle East hub and battling it out with the Emirati airlines like Emirates and Etihad apart from Qatar Airways. So Saudi plans to increase international routes from 99 to about 250 and also triple annual passenger traffic. The kingdom is spending heavily to transform its aviation sector and wants to set up a new national airline and massive airport in Riyadh to boost connectivity. All this is also relevant in many ways to India because a lot of that traffic potentially goes from India. So it's in India's interests to ensure that either Indian airlines drive that traffic or it benefits somehow monetarily. Boeing at the Dubai Air Show dominated the place, racking up about 313 orders and Airbus could get about 86 as of Friday, the last day of the Biennial Air Show. Australia win the World Cup. India lost to Australia in the finals of the World Cup Cricket 2023 on Sunday night, ending six weeks of anticipation and hope that India as host country would win the trophy. Be that as it may, the matches were definitely a boost for the economy and the games played saw considerable boosts in spending on hospitality and allied services. Ahmedabad perhaps benefited the most since two key matches, India versus Pakistan and the finals, India versus Australia, were played there. So looking back six weeks, what were the takeaways and lessons, if one may call it that, and what can India do here on and what could it focus on? 
To discuss this, I spoke to our regular contributor on this theme, cricket commentator and writer Ayaz Memon, and I began by asking him how he looked back at the matches and tournament now that it had all ended. The length of the tournament till the final, I thought India was in brilliant form, ticked all the boxes, just looked just about the best team. And then, you know, it's it's unfortunate. You have one off day and you lose. And that's how the cookie crumbles in sport. You know, you can't afford to rest on past laurels. You won 10 matches or whatever it is. You reach the final and, you know, it all goes kaput. And when you look back, Ayaz, you know, one of the things you pointed out was that not just India, but many teams took the whole tournament for granted. And you had some of these relatively weaker teams like Afghanistan, Netherlands, Bangladesh, all sort of springing surprises. So I'm assuming that's something that people will not forget as they go into the next round. I hope so. I mean, look, Netherlands, Afghanistan, some of these weaker teams or the minnow teams, as we call them, they need to play more international cricket. And that can only come when you know other teams are willing to play them outside of the World Cup. So, yeah, I mean, I did mention that the other teams were a little casual getting into the tournament because, look, it was a long-drawn tournament and that's one of the reasons why it's so important to retain fitness and focus, both. It's a six-week long tournament, it starts six days and sustained excellence is what you want. Now, you know, Australia actually started off poorly, losing two, well, two matches to start with and then picked up pace and then they had this surge they had some really tough matches along the way and they won each of those tough encounters, you know, including against Afghanistan where it seemed all lost. Afghanistan really put them through the grinder. They won that, they won a tough semi-final, they won a tough match against New Zealand. So in that sense, looking back, you can say that Australia reached the final primed for a tough contest. You know, they were doggedly focused on winning the tournament. India coasted through to the final. So they had not really had experienced any big hardship. Now, this is all post-facto analysis, as I mentioned. There was no need to be, if you're coasting through, you're coasting through. Why should you want hardship for yourself? So, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, sport, as much as it can be great delight, it can also be very cruel when you're not willing. <laughs> right, and I'll come to the future in a moment. But in terms of individual performances across the board or across all teams, Anything that stands out to you as a takeaway, not just for cricket, but in general? Yeah, I mean, look, I thought the Indian team's approach, you know, was very dynamic. So this was very thought out. I think the tactics were all right. The execution for the most part, except the final, you know, six, seven hours of poor cricket, I would say. And one has to say poor cricket. Not because the skills were poor by the Indians, but just that the Australians on that day were far better. And they put pressure on India, which India could not finally cope with. Otherwise, in terms of tactics, in terms of, you know, the very exuberant approach, very positive approach. And then everybody delivering, you know, since the role definitions are very strong. Who will do what, what is expected of each player. And if you look back, there's not one player who you can point out and say, hey, you know, this guy failed or he didn't live up to expectation. There's not one player. And what about individual performances as, you know, individual players who have left Mark, at least in your mind? From India, it would be Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli, certainly. And then Mohamed Shami, Jasprit Bumrah. These are the four players who really stand out. Shreya Sayyar and KL Rahul did extremely well. They were not amongst the big guns, so to speak. Rohit and Virat were. But they had a very good tournament, except in the final. So, there are many success stories. Also in the World Cup, look at what Travis Head has done. You know, to come out and play that kind of an innings in the final. It was breathtaking. It took your breath away. It also took the game away from India. And this is not the first time that Head has done this against India. He's your nemesis in chief now. Because a few months back, uh, in the World Test Championship, finally you smashed 100 there also and took that match away from India. He's a player for the big occasion. And that is something one has to learn from him. Maybe find out more about how he managed to do this. Because he's not as big a star as Rohit or Virat or Jadeja or some of the others. But he's done it twice in a row against India. And looking ahead, I asked, so how do we or where do you feel the Indian team should? I mean, you mentioned, you know, sustained excellence. Now, of course, these things are easier said. And it also sort of presumes that there was no sustained excellence on the part of the Indian team. But as you look ahead, where would you think or feel the Indian team needs to build upon? So, Govin, I mean, this is again speculative, but some of the players are in their mid-30s now. The next World Cup is four years away, the 50-over World Cup. So while there will be bilateral series and India versus England or X, Y, Z, how many players will last for four more years in terms of fitness and form is open to question. 
somebody like a Virat Kohli who's still supremely fit, in my opinion, will last four years. Some of the others might not. So either they rededicate themselves to becoming, you know, planning for the future themselves in collaboration with the selectors and the administration. And there's no dearth of young talent. So you have to start looking at younger players, kind of fill in, not looking at a large scale overall. You're not looking at saying, oh, out of 15 players in the squad, let's change 10, 12. That's not needed. That might, you know, kind of create problems of its own in the short and medium term. But what certainly needs to be done is a defeat like this after such a splendid run can dent, it will scar the psyche. Obviously, it is going to hurt all these players because they played so fabulously and the expectation was there that they would win. And then you come a cropper. So now you have to kind of management of motivation has to take place. Even in the short term, because you don't enter the next match, you know, you feel drained. We've played the World Cup so hard. We played so fabulously. We've still lost. And therefore, what else can be done now? You can get a little fatalistic or a little demotivated. That needs to be addressed. Right. And I guess that's a good point to end on. I mean, you know, focus on the spirit first and then the rest of it. And build spirits or rather rebuild spirits. Great. Ayaz, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Bye-bye. And that's it from me for today. Have a great day ahead and see you tomorrow, same time. This was the core report with me, Govind Raj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you, including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening.